speaker of today is Carmelo Puliatti from the Basque Country, who will speak about the health boundedness of gradients of single layer potentials for elliptic operators with coefficients of Dini mean oscillation type. Correct. Thank you, Damien. Thanks a lot. And first, I'd like to start by thanking the organizer for making this event possible. Um, so thank you. Uh, then, Singular integrals operator have been widely investigated in connection with the geometry of sets and measures. So in this talk, I'm going to present a joint work with Alejandro Molero, Mielis Morcoglu, and Juliet Tolsa, in which we study a class of singular integral operators, which arises naturally from the a PDE context. So without any further introduction, let me start the point of work. Oh. Got it? Okay. Let's do it. All right. So let K be a Calderon Zygmunt kernel. I'll give more precise definitions later. Think about it uh, for the time being, just think about it as the race transform if you prefer it. And let mu be a random measure on the Euclidean space, which for this talk I'm going to indicate as Rn plus one. So uh, the prototypical Calderon Zygmunt uh, operator, uh, the prototypical singular integral operator, is an operator of the type you, you see displayed here on the slide. That is the integral of k of x and y uh, times f over the measuring e. In general, of course, this writing doesn't make sense, and it's purely for, uh, purely formal, at least uh, on the support of measure. And in order to make sense of this. The one introduces the truncations at the level of a parameter epsilon here and just ruling the singularity out. So in order to avoid the, to deal with those operators and to avoid the problems of excessive precise values, which in this measure theoretic setting is not obvious and it, it can be very hard sometimes, uh, one can still talk about boundedness, L2 boundedness of this operator, asking that the truncation at the level of epsilon are bounded on L2 uniformly on, uh, on epsilon. And throughout this talk, I will indicate as uh, the L2 L2 norm of T, uh, this supreme. Right. One of the milestones that connected singular integrals to the geometric measures is the pioneering work of Calderon in 1977, in which he proved that the Cauchy transform is bounded on L2 on Lipschitz graphs with small constant. Uh, this last assumption was eventually removed uh, by Kaufman, McIntosh, and Mayer a few years later. There's, this result is very important, important because Lipschitz graphs are the building blocks of one of the main subjects of geometric measure theory, that is to say, rectifiable sets, which I'm not going to introduce much, much because they've already been discussed a lot throughout the conference. So, the question uh, one uh, could ask is, can we use Cauchy transform or singular integrals in general to study and maybe characterize rectifiability? You see that rectifiability is a qualitative concept, uh, although the L2 boundedness requires quantitative estimate. And this is why uh, David and Sams introduced the concept of uniform rectifiability. Okay, I'm not, uh, again, I'm not gonna uh, give the definition, the, uh, discuss the definition a lot, but just notice that here uh, I indicate by an uh, alpha that is regular measure, a measure which has polynomial growth both from below and from above. And yes. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you a lot. Uh, all right. So, uh, I will indicate by M D plus the set of positive random measures on R M plus one, which for which this uh, right uh, this right relation holds, or namely that they have upper D growth. All right. So one of the prototypical uh, singular integral operators is the risk transform that is, which I define here with parameter D, and of course in this formal sense. All right. One of the, uh, of the main problems uh, posed by David and Sams in the 90s is whether under the background assumption that the measure mu is 
the alphas that are irregular on Rn plus one, uniform rectifiability can, uh, can be characterized by the boundedness of the n plus one components of the D-arrays transform. David and Sam's proved that uh, one way holds, that, uh, namely that the uh, race transform is bounded on uniformly rectifiable sets, on uniformly rectifiable measures in this case. And indeed, they also proved something way more general that I'm not going to discuss here. Uh, the converse question turned out to be more delicate. And it was proved in 1977 by Matila Melnikov and Verdera by a curvature techniques that the Cauchy transform, which corresponds to the, uh, to the race transforming in the, on the plane, uh, if the Cauchy transform is bounded on L, L2, then the measure is uniformly rectifiable. However, the curvature technique uh, couldn't be extended to the higher uh, dimensional case. And it took uh, almost 20 years to provide uh, for Nazaro uh, Tolson and Volberg to provide a proof which works in the co-dimension one case. That is this case. All right. So uh, Nazaro Tolson and Volberg result uh, is very important also in light of the many applications that he had. For, that it had, for example, to the study of harmonic measure. So one can ask whether there is an analogous result which works in the elliptic setting, or whether David and Sam's problem, at least in co-dimension one, can be formulated in the elliptic setting. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to, I'm going to consider uh, second or, uh, order uh, PDs in divergence form associated with uniform elliptic matrices with variable coefficients. Uh, here, uh, I displayed this, uh, the standard def uh, definition of uh, uniform elliptic matrices. Uh, and uh, for the time being, uh, I'm going to consider the, co the coefficients to be in L infinity. So uh, we consider the associated op uh, the operator as uh, associated uh, to the matrix A, and uh, I'm going to indicate it as LA, and where this expression has to be understood in the distributional sense. So uh, in the 80s, Grutten and Wiedemann proved that uh, under the mere uh, uh, essential bounded uh, assumption on the matrix, if uh, we have a bounded domain, then there exists a grain function. Uh, the, uh, the result was uh, generalized for unbounded domains and for also for systems indeed uh, by Hoffman and Kim in 2007. And uh, so we know that there, un, uh, under this hypothesis, there exists a fundamental solution to this equation, namely a, a function of x and y that verifies these identities, where uh, the letter x here on the left-hand side means that the operator acts on the variable x, right? So, so in general, we don't have an explicit uh, formula for for the fundamental solution for, for L infinity coefficients. But we know uh, how, uh, what the fundamental solution is if the matrix has constant coefficient. So in this particular case, I'm going to indicate it as theta in order to differentiate it and to make it more evident. And we know that the fundamental solution is just a function of the difference of X and Y. And we know much more indeed. First, it depends only on the symmetric part of the matrix A, which I'm going to indicate here as A0S. And it also has an explicit uh, an expression. So in particular, if we compute the gradient, it has this, uh, it can be written in this form where omega n is the volume of the n-dimensional sphere. So, you may see that this uh, form, uh, this expression uh, is very similar to the race transform indeed. In particular, if the matrix is the identity, uh, we have the, the, the operator, this is minus the Laplacian, and the gradient of the fundamental solution coincides with the risk kernel modulo uh, multiplicative dimensional constant, okay? So we may be tempted to use the gradient of the fundamental solution as our kernel in the single integral operator. 
So, and we made attempt to, to write this operator that you said displayed here. This is a well-known operator in PDEs, and it is uh, often referred to as the gradient of the single layer potential. However, if we uh, just assume the coefficients of the matrix A to be in L infinity, it's quite problematic to study this operator from the, uh, uh, from the calderon zygmunt point of view. Indeed, uh, this, the grand of the fundamental solution in general, it's uh, neither homogeneous nor antisymmetric. And, and of course, it is not of calderon zygmunt type, not even locally. So what we have to do in order to study it from the calderon zygmunt point of view is to add more assumption. One way to go is to add more assumption on the matrix A, right? For example, one natural assumption, uh, which one cannot, uh, can add, is the Hilder continuity of the matrix. Indeed, it is possible to see that if the matrix Hilder continues, the, uh, the, uh, the gradient of the fundamental solution is locally a calderon zygmunt kernel. So in recent, year, uh, in recent years, uh, it has been proved and uh, it has been investigated uh, uh, an elliptic analog of the, the resistance problem uh, under this uh, Hilder continuity assumption for the matrix. And it, and it has been proved that if the measuring mu is n alpha of it regular uh, with compact support, which comes from the lack of uh, uh, scale invariance of the uh, Hilder matrices, then Uniform rectifiability uh, can be characterized by the L2 boundedness of the gradient of the single layer potential. One way, uh, that is to say, the boundedness of single layer potential on uniform rectifiable measures with compact support, was proved by uh, uh, Jose Conde Alonso, Mialis Morgolo, and Xavier Tolson. And the other way was proved uh, uh, by Laura Pratt, Xavier Tolson, and myself. Did uh, what uh, it has been proved in this two papers, uh, it's also more than this. Uh, we, we know also other results which are related with the David Sam's problem and the L2 boundedness of these singular integral operators. In particular, one result, one important result for in this setting, uh, which served also as a point, uh, as a, which also inspired the techniques of Nazaro Tos and Volber, let's say is the following result of Edelman, Nazaro, and Volberg, who proved that if the measuring mu uh, is totally lower irregular, that is to say, it has positive and finite upper density and vanishing uh, lower density almost everywhere, mu, mu almost everywhere, then the risk transform is, cannot be bounded on L2. This was proved in the elliptic setting uh, with Hilder continuity assumption by, again, by Conde Alonso uh, Morgoli and Tolson. Another important result, uh, which of Nazaro Tolson Volberg is the following. If we uh, have a set E with uh, finite Hausdorff measure and Hausdorff measure, and we assume that uh, the associated risk transform is bounded on L2, then the set E is rectified. And again, uh, this followed uh, from, uh, this follows from the work of uh, Laura Pratt, so it also myself. So a couple of remarks uh, on these results before we went to, uh, to, to state uh, the, the main result of the talk. So the, uh, the proof of, of this res, uh, of the results in the field or continuous case uh, relies on a delicate uh, variant of the general scheme of, uh, of the uh, corresponding results for the risk transfer. And also, uh, well, as I already said, one of the main motivations was the application to the elliptic measure. So the initial question at this point are whether we can uh, weaken the hypothesis on the matrix, for example, and if we can find an alternative approach, maybe also, uh, also a unified approach to these results, which doesn't rely on repeating this, the same grand scheme of the, uh, of the uh, works for the risk transfer. All right. So uh, uh, in our joint work, we identified a setting which we can answer this question. So uh, in order to 
define and command the setting, I need few definitions uh, for this space, which we, uh, is, a, is related with this Dini minus selection condition. So for a point X in Rn plus one and a radius R, we denote by B the ball, and by A bar at XR, the average of the, mat of the matrix uh, of the, uh, at the level of the ball here. And we indicate by omega A, this L1 oscillation of the matrix uh, uh, around the average. So we say that the matrix A has Dini mean oscillation if uh, omega A, the oscillation, verifies this Dini assumption, okay? Why, uh, why did we start this? Because uh, in recent years, uh, there has been uh, few results have been proved for this class of matrices under, of course, the uniform electricity assumption. In particular, in 2017, uh, Dong and Kim proved that if u, if u is a function which satisfies uh, L of uh, this partial differential equation in a ball, B of zero n, where n is large enough, say, then u is indeed C1 in the closure of the unit ball, okay? Indeed, they proved also uh, much more. They also proved estimates for, L infinity estimates for the gradients, the gradient on the solution in terms of the L1 norm of the gradient itself. Uh, uh, why is it helpful for us? Because from these estimates, it directly follows that the gradient of the fundamental solution is uh, of Calderon's zygmunt type with this sort of modulus of continuity, okay? At least at the local level, you see that the locality is evident by the presence of the parameter R. Okay, so I'm ready to, uh, to state the main result of the, of the talk. So uh, assume that uh, mu is a positive random measure with n growth on Rn plus one and with compact support. We assume that, uh, we further assume that the uniformly elliptic matrix A belong to this uh, modified DD class. Th uh, that is to say, it satisfies these two assumptions. Observe that the first one is a second Dini assumption, which is also equivalent by Fubini with a log Dini assumption. Uh, and it holds at small scales, let's say. Uh, uh, and also, and the second assumption uh, is, uh, is a Dini at large scale assumption, which is also, which is necessary, uh, which is necessary for our arguments to work. And under these assumptions, what uh, we proved is that the L2, L2 norm of the risk transfer can be bounded by the L2, L2 norm of the gradient of the singularity potential Modulo an additive constant here, where this constant is depends on the dimension, the ellipticity of, of the matrix, and the growth uh, constant of the growth constant on you and on the parameter, on the diameter. Sorry. And indeed, we proved also the vice versa. That is to say, the same thing holds if we reverse the roles of the risk transform and the gradient of singularity potential. Okay. So uh, a, a few comments on this uh, DMO tilde assumption. So uh, it is satisfies if the metric is Hilder. So it, it is a generalization of Hilder. You, you can see it here, why? And it is a strict generalization. It, uh, in particular, it is not hard to find an example of a matrix which is in DMO tilde, but it is not Hilder, right? And the example is displayed here. Moreover, it is, uh, one can see, and for example, uh, the, as a reference in the work of Lee, that uh, the oscillation is doubling, satisfies the doubling assumption, where the constant kappa here is purely dimensional. So in particular, this says that if the matrix A belongs to DMO tilde, then it satisfies the mean oscillation condition too. Uh, a last thing is that if um, uh, that I have to uh, remark is that if 
a, mat uh, a, a matrix is in DMO, then it is almost everywhere equivalent to a uniformly continuous matrix uh, with modulus of continuity uh, the given by the Dini integral. However, this we cannot use this result, this fact, because we are working with uh, measures which are uh, lower dimensional measures, I and mean, we are working with n measure, measures which with n growth and are n plus one. So this almost everywhere <laughs> is not good enough for us. So in the in the ten minutes I have left, I'm I'm going to sketch I'm to quickly sketch the proof of this. I'm going to prove just that the race transform is bounded by one plus uh, the L2, L2 norm of the operator T. So consider uh, uh, measuring me on this class and consider a cube which contains the whole support of the measure where L uh, by cube, I just mean a, a regular Euclidean cube in Rn plus one. I, I indicate by LQ the diameter uh, and by X zero, the single word cube. Uh, possibly by chopping the cube, by splitting the cube, uh, I can assume uh, for for the time being, I can assume that the uh, the length of the side length of the cube is small enough. Uh, we can reduce the hypothesis to this by just by uh, by a gluing argument for for the the, the SMS you will see later. Okay, so. Uh, what uh, a naive approach may be, may, may be to just bound the uh, the L two norm of the risk transform of function f, or rather its truncation, by a triangle inequality, and compare try to compare uh, this guy with the uh, the gradient of the single layer potential. Okay. So uh, for us, it would be enough to prove that. Uh, uh, a condition like the, the one displayed in the second line holds, that is to say that we have the uh, modular terms, which namely uh, terms that goes to zero as LQ goes to zero, uh, that R is bounded by, uh, by this expression, okay? Uh, what we would like to have is, uh, is that the race transform of, uh, of F is, uh, is finite. Because if this were the case, we could just uh, group the second summon inside the first, inside the, the, the left hand side. And we would be able to prove uh, our, uh, an estimate like the one that I show here at the end of, of the slide. Uh, in particular, I observed that uh, the parameter epsilon here is small, but if eventually the smallness will be canceled by the fact that we have to glue together all the uh, all the estimates for the small cubes. Okay, so this the, this finiteness of the race transform is purely qualitative, say, and it can be obtained, for example, by introducing an auxiliary measure and proving a result for a, approximation results for the auxiliary measure. Okay, so we are left with the bound of the L two norm of this difference. So if you are able to bound this, we are fine. So uh, how uh, how can we argue? First of all, first we, uh, it's important to compare to uh, the fact that the gradient of the single uh, layer potential is comparable to the race transform at the level of the cube. But this may not always be the case. But uh, in order to achieve this comparability with the race transform itself, instead of a transformation, we can substitute the measure with a uh, proper, properly defined, suitably defined um, uh, transformation, Balifi's transformation, so that the symmetric part of the matrix at the level of a set, which is at the level of the cube, indeed, is the identity. In this case, by what I saw before, uh, said before, we have that it will coincide with the race transform at that level. And at this point, we, we, use a, we would use a, a big gun, let's say, which is uh, a result of the, uh, 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 the, joint, uh, the combined papers of uh, uh, Dombrowski and Tolson, Tolson who proved that uh, the, the comparability of the race transform, uh, the beneficial invariance of the race transform. Okay. 
then in this case, uh, so, so we are left with uh, the quantitative, the estimate of the difference of, of the two operators here. We are going to argue by a pointwise estimate. So first, we, uh, what we want to do, uh, and our argument works on three steps, which uh, each of which is very important. First, we want to compare the gradient of the fundamental solution with uh, the gradient of the fundamental solution associated with an average matrix at the level of the difference of, of, of these two points. And we want this uh, comparability to be in terms of this quantity, which also observed that motivates our DMO tilde assumptions, indeed, which comes from requiring that this, uh, this quantity is integrable, is the integral. So uh, indeed, if we have this, we would have by Schur's test that uh, we can bound the L2 norm, L2, L2 norm of the operator. And also observe that we need this, uh, uh, this uh, the implicit constant here depends on the radius r. Uh, but for uh, what uh, one can prove is that for a radius smaller than one, say, uh, this constant uh, is uniform uh, on the on the on radii, which is the case that is interest to us. So uh, how to prove this? I cannot go into the details, but just quickly, uh, we uh, write uh, this representation for, uh, we use the representation formula for the difference for which I refer to the, the paper of Hoffman and Kim. Uh, and, and we have this representation. So we uh, analyzed the three, uh, three separate contributions to this integral, that is, to say the contribution around X, the contribution around Y, and the contribution far away from X and Y. Uh, for the estimates of the first one, uh, the first and the second, we just use the oscillation plus some delicate, uh, pl pl plus we apply uh, the gradient estimates. And it's quite technical, so I'm not gonna, going to go into the details. And the, observe that the third term is what gives us the, uh, necessity of also a condition at the small scales, and it, it gives us the terms at the small scales. So the second one, the, the second uh, step is to remove the, um, is to reduce the case to the level of the truncations. And this uh, indeed to pass from the average of the matrix uh, of the, uh, the uh, center, uh, at, at the ball center the text and radius x minus comparable to x minus y to a ball uh, at the level of the truncations. And this is important because it takes one variable away from the average, and which is going to be fundamental for the uh, third and final step. And this is done just by using the, uh, the just by making computations using the explicit uh, formula for the fundamental solutions for constant coefficients matrix. The, so we, uh, we pass from the level of X minus Y to the level of the truncations, but in order to achieve the, uh, the full estimate, we have to go back, uh, to go up to the level of the, of the cube. So in order to be able to compare it with the race transform. And the way, the way to do it, uh, the way we did it is via the expansions in spherical harmonics. We defined the kernel uh, calligraphic K to, this, uh, to be this difference. And after observing that uh, this difference is uh, homogeneous of degrees minus n for every x fixed, you see, I mean, this is just the homogeneity of the fundamental solutions. We have that by ellipticity of a, uh, this fu function calligraphic k belongs to L2 of the sphere. So we can expand it in spherical harmonics, uh, which I indicated by phi j which are, uh, in the, uh, whose multiplicity I denote here by NJ. And we can write this, uh, the kernel in using this expansion. So, so in order to deal with this expansion, first we, uh, we need to know the, the precise, uh, we need to know the asymptotics of the cardinality of NJ. And then uh, we also uh, can prove that 
the the, um, the kernel k as, uh, has derivatives with sat satisfies this bound here. Uh, so finally, uh, we use again this uh, this big result of the Broskin Tulsa and Tulsa, uh, which combined with previous uh, work of Kilo Sadion, give that the L2 L2 norm of these uh, auxiliary operators can be bounded by the L2 L2 norm of the race transform, uh, where the multiplicative constant J uh, J comes from this from this previous. Uh, this previous display that I wrote here. Okay, so uh, just the last slide, and in the last slide, I'm, I'm going to make a couple of comments. So this gives an alternative. The proof that I outlined here gives a, uh, an, uh, also uh, a proof which works in the DML tilde settings, where uh, the, it's not clear how to replicate the scheme of Nazarotos and Volberg, which was replicated in the Hilder setting. Because uh, very, uh, it involves a, a, a careful reflection argument for the matrix. Okay. So we have also more results in the paper, which I don't have time to talk about in this talk. And indeed, uh, a uh, variant of the argument I explained here also pro uh, proves uh, the generalization to uh, to DM, to this DM tilde class of our, our result first proved by Hilasarian and Tulsa in, for the uh, risk transformer, which was also mentioned by, by Mar uh, Marty Pras in, in the previous talk. And then uh, I've re uh, recently generalized, I've re generalized in the, uh, my PhD for uh, thesis for Hildor continuous matrices, and which is used for the study of uh, free bound two phase free boundary problems for elliptic matrices. And this is all I wanted to say, and thank you for your attention.